one of the many things that was unique about Yogu was after having done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of interviews with people. The day after I did my interview with her on the telephone, she called me at home and said, Elliot, it's Yoko. I just wanted to tell you that I really liked what we did yesterday. That was very kind of you, the questions you asked, and I felt as some, some kind of sensitivity about it, and I appreciated it. No one in my media career had ever taken the time to do that. You don't get thanked, you know? No, it's not a very, it's not a very common thing. A so day later, I called her back, and I said, look, I don't, I don't want to bother you or anything. I'm not on the air. I'm just at home. But the fact that you called me to thank you, thank me for doing the radio interview with you, it just it blew my mind. I mean, the gift was for me. And so began a conversation, almost a nightly dialogue between the two of us, sometimes going into three, four, five hours into the night, New York to L.A. I'm an insomniac. I don't sleep. She wakes up really early in the morning. In those days, she would take an ice bath to wake up. She would fill the bathtub with ice cubes and cold water and get out of bed uh, and jump into the tub. Felt it was good for the circulation. An absolute nightmare as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and so when she would get up early, I would just be falling out and we developed a meaningful friendship. There did come a time, obviously, when her husband was a little curious about where his wife would be going off to to make these phone calls. And when I first spoke to John, I believe it was on the evening of his 30th or his 31st birthday, one or the other. And again, it was a telephone conversation. Had to be his 31st, had to be 71. It was, now that I think of it. 1971, KLOS Radio. Um, agree that we're going to talk. I didn't speak with him. It was set up through, uh, I think, John Hendricks or, so, or, or an assistant at the Dakota. And I dialed a number, and there was John on the other end of a live telephone, and I'm on live on KLOS. It's not a pre recorded interview. And uh, we spoke for about 40 minutes, celebrating his 31st birthday over the radio. If you scroll around this website, you will find many hours of recollections of my years with John and Yoko. You will be able to access radio interviews that span the course of our relationship. You will also be able to view some of the endless television interviews I did about our years together. I'm hoping that you will gain greater insight about these two extraordinary people through the reportage. What you are about to hear is an interview recorded on October 8, 1971, on the eve of John's 31st birthday. It was the first time we had ever spoken. Many interviews would follow in the nine years that we shared. But for now, this is how it began. Yeah, hello? Hello, John. Oh, hello, Elliot. Yes, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? It's so good to be talking with you at long last. Yeah, same to you. You did some good stuff with Yoko. I appreciate that. Yeah, it was great. I read it again in um, LA Free Press, was it? Yes, that's the, they put the transcript in Yeah, there. it was very good. Well, you know, she, she, as I don't have to tell you, she is just such an incredible woman, such a complex woman, that it was just such a delight to be able to communicate with her. Well, you know? she enjoyed it very much, and uh, I appreciate you, uh, you know, doing it and playing the record and everything. 
normally I, uh, you know, I sort of uh, keep butting in, and she never gets a word in. So <laughs> to do things on her own occasionally, right? Are you are you kind of comfortable now for a few minutes? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Great. Uh, all right. Yesterday, John, you did become 31 years old. Right. Do you have any thoughts or reflections about growing older, the concept of age? Do you consider that stuff at all? Well, um, I, I, of course I think about it, but um, I'll, t I'll just sort of reel off uh, bits and pieces that come to me about age. I, I know the uh, first thing I think of is Yoko and I as a, a nice old couple, right, off the coast of Ireland or <laughs> something like that. Right. Like Cornwall or whatever it is. That's the initial dream. And... Uh, I don't have a, any fear of age. I, I'm sort of looking forward to it, you know. I sort of think, well, maybe I won't be so frantic when I'm older, or, you know, both of us will be less frantic, or, you know, we'll be taking life easy. I like thinking what I might be doing then. And uh, I certainly don't wish I was any younger, because, uh, I don't know, about 30, 31, and uh, I suppose, uh, you know, for quite a, I don't know how long, 10, 15 years, maybe more, it's, uh, you are less frantic than you are when you're 20 or 18, or oh, certainly I am anyway. And so it, uh, it's just a nice age, you know. I mean, my, my auntie Mimi used to always say to me, you know, 30 is the right age for a man or that year, and I thought she was just giving me a lot of <laughs> bull, you know. But uh, in a way she was right, you know, it was like an old wives' tale, and uh, it's a good age because you're sort of, uh, you're not old. And uh, you sort of had some experience, and like she used to say, you've become a man of the world, right? I mean, you don't have to travel the world to do that, but that's what she was talking about. It's amazing how true it seemed to be, and that's what I feel about it, really. Uh, uh, I enjoy it, you know. And um, there was an exchange, and I'd be happy to supply you with the original yeah. audio tape, yeah. if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. And it felt really good. It felt really good. And strangely enough, a couple of days later, at three or four in the morning when I was about to go to sleep, um, the phone rang and he said, um, so, uh, you know, I, I, liked some, I liked what you asked me about, especially the flying bit. You know, you talked to me about why I write about flying and dreams and suddenly I'm talking to him for three hours. Uh, but he went. He, did, he he would like to go back to sleep. He wasn't an early riser, so I would kind of close my eyes. And two hours later, y Yoko would call. And for you needed to get them in the same time zone as you because you're not sleeping at all. I don't sleep at all. Still don't sleep. But I found myself having conversations with the two of them almost on a nightly basis for months and months and months. Um, now, are they talking politics? Because this is a moment when Jerry Rubin is in their life and Abby Hoffman is in their they're, life. They're talking everything. They're, they're giving me an audio oral journal of their experiences about their politics, about spirit, about literature, about books. Uh, it got to a point where John would call. Keep in mind, this was the before cable, before um, there were time zones. John would watch Walter Cronkite in New York at 3 p.m. Pacific time, he would call me and tell me what things to look for when the news went on at 6 and for me to call him back with a reaction to how he perceived what happened. And I would. And maybe two or three hours later, Yoko would call me and say, I heard what you said to John. That's not the, that, that's not the right take on it. My life became part of the John and Yoko experience as if they were best friends of mine who I had not yet met. I don't believe they knew what I looked like. I knew what they looked like. I hadn't been on television yet. So when does the album come to you? I'm curious about the album. One day, one day, they uh, call me. It was either John or Yoko and say, hello, hello, hello. Um, we uh, got into a car and we drove across the country. We're in California now, we're in LA, and we want to meet you. And I said, fabulous. Um, and I said, fine, we're... Oh, oh. This was in 1972. They drove across the country, and I said, okay, great, where are you? My 
thinking was that they would be at a, a local hotel near the Sunset Strip, not far from where I lived. And he said, let me put you on the telephone with somebody who is driving us, who drove us across the country, and he'll give you the directions. And a guy gets on the phone, and they, of course, were aiming for L.A., but wound up in a place called Ojai, California, um, outside of an, a community called Santa Barbara. Took a wrong turn on the freeway. So they were about a uh, hundred miles away from me. I got into the car and I drove. Uh, following the directions, I met them in a field. Uh, they, uh, they described the car that they were in. I think it was a Rambler. So the back seats could kind of go backwards. Remember that old funky car? It had a, uh, <laughs> it had a turntable a turntable that played 45 RPM records that was attached to the bottom of the dashboard. <laughs> Haven't seen one since. Yeah. And in our days... So you're, in a, you're, in a, you're in a farm? Uh, we're in a field. That's where we meet. I pull my car up to this Rambler. There's nothing else out there. I mean, the directions were really good. And I got out of the car. And um, the door opened, and John and Yoko got out. And um, the first thing he said to me was, go on, give her a hug. And I walked over to Yoko, and I hugged her, and then I hugged him. And he said, we're renting a little place a couple of miles from here. Just follow us. And I followed them to a little house that they were renting. And it was at that house that we had our first in-person conversation around the pool. I remember Yoko, <clears throat> she had very, very beautiful, long black hair past her waist at the time. And she was wearing a swimsuit and she laid down on the diving board and her hair fell just shy an inch or two from the water in the pool. And I heard John behind me saying, I'm just going to slip into my swimming costume, but I'm a little shy, you know. And we talked for four or five hours. And um, we talked differently in person than on the telephone. OK, so second time I'm asked. Sometime in New York City album because it's, it is a great story I, I want to hear. So they give you... After, after my day with them in Ojai, John said, Look, we just finished doing this recording. I have an acetate. Um, they didn't have a record player, that's what they were called then, uh, in the house. My car, of course, and it was Sunday, and I was on the air Sunday from 8 to midnight. All I knew is that I was just handed this acetate, and he said, nobody has played it, nobody has heard it, it's just for you, please put it on the radio. One second, that was good, and we lost all of it, right? He said, I want to give you this acetate, and nobody is played it, very few people have heard it, we want to give it to you so you can play it on your radio show. So you're the very first public person? To the very best of my knowledge, I'm the first person who played anything off of some time in New York City on the radio. Take and the, he, he autographed it uh, to me and both of them did little doodles. I, I still saved the original acetate in the white case. 1972, almost half a lifetime ago. And I got into the car and I just zoomed 100 miles back to Los Angeles, got on the radio station and told the listeners, look, uh, it's a special night, a special experience. And I told them I met John and Yoko that afternoon and um, I have a copy of their new album, so let's not play any commercials. Um, let's not even discuss it. Just sit back. Well, I probably used my FM voice then. I bring this acetate into the radio station. I hand it to the engineer who's in another room. 
I do my opening rap about meeting John and Yoko in the afternoon and enjoy the record, hold the commercials, and I cue the engineer. And the record plays. And I'm listening, you know, through earphones, because that's how you hear it in a radio station. And um, the tunes start to go by. And I recall um, my ears opening uh, with a song called, I'm going to change the word because I don't use it, but the word was, woman is the N of the world, followed by a song about Angela Davis, Attica. Attica State Prison. Um, now, what the engineer thinking? Is there somebody, is he thought <laughs> along with it? Well, the first thing was, what was I thinking? Now, I have to tell you, if the truth be told, the, uh, Channel A and Channel B was going on. On Channel A, I felt this probably was going to be the end of my radio career for obvious reasons. Channel B said, I've never heard anything like this. I mean, this is just extraordinary stuff. And again, if you were to listen to Woman is the End of the World, um, as offensive as that word is, and as much pain as that word has caused, what John was saying about the way we perceive women in the world is as spot on today as it was then. It's an album that uh, was not particularly well received. That okay. would be uh, putting it politely. Yeah, how, how was it taken? John was excited about it, but it was not. Well, play the thing out. Did the engineer, did anybody? On Channel A and B, um, I, I realized that uh, uh, I, I was walking the plank. On Channel B, it was cementing my belief that John and Yoko were taking us to a place that nobody had dared take us to before, unabashedly without apology or pretense. I opened my eyes and I looked through the glass and I saw my engineer who was staring directly at me, probably with thoughts in his mind of where he'd be working tomorrow, whether he would be receiving some kind of notification from the FCC. And when I looked at him, I thought about my conversation with the radio station management, uh, possible advertisers, what people would say. I mean. I understood the power of some time in New York City, and it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Those who could hear it were touched by it, and those who couldn't were frightened by it. Well, when Rolling Stone, who was a huge fan of John, called it career suicide. Really? Yeah. Who wrote the review? I don't remember. But I know that John was really taken back the album was received. Was he not, or was that, did he not give a shit? Oh, no. John cared deeply about how everything he did was received. And you could mess with some of his um, thoughts about various subjects, but don't mess with the art. I made that mistake later, which I'll tell you about when he recorded a song called God. But when it comes to the work, that for him was sacrosanct. Um, so was he upset that the New York, the Sometime New York City album was a flop? I mean, it is the only it, commercially, you know. He was not only disappointed and angry, and yes, John Lennon got angry. Um, he couldn't understand the degree of opposition to something that to him appeared so obvious and truthful. And he felt, um, if you don't get this, you don't get me. And if you're just looking for the happy mop top beetle, uh, don't send me a fan letter. This is the era in which we're living. These are the issues that I'm thinking about. 
It's certainly him at his most radical, at his most political. Yes. It's, it's him, uh, as he said, you know, he wanted the album to feel like it was ripped right from the headlines, recorded very quickly. Um, he's also, at this point, uh, being illegally followed by the FBI in the Nixon administration. Uh, did he did he talk to you about that? Did he did he was he afraid that he was making it up? That he was being paranoid? Did did he know that he was being bugged and followed? When I met them on that day uh, in Ojai and went back to that house. Before we got into any substantive conversations, Yoko took my hand and led me into the bathroom of the house and did this. And we, when we went into the bathroom, she sat on the edge of the tub and motioned to me to do the same. And she turned the water on. to start filling the bath. I didn't have a clue what was going on. As the bath water was filling up, she leaned over and whispered to me that the two of them were under surveillance, that they knew that they were being followed and bugged by the federal government. And we should be careful about what we talk about and when we go back outside to the pool to be aware of that. Did they know why? Did they have a clue why that, that was the case? I mean, did they know that it was connected to John with Abby Hoffman, with Jerry Rubin? Did they know that it was connected to their one dis once upon a time decision to, to, to campaign against Nixon? John never expressed to me why they were being bugged because he was confused by it. Intellectually, he knew that the government believed that he was an anti-war protester. He was. That he was anti-Vietnam. He was. That he had enormous influence over a constituency of millions. He was. That, um, he was a threat. that they perceived him as some kind of threat to the U.S. government. Intellectually, he knew that. They also believed falsely, as has been revealed in FBI declassified documents, that he was going to go to the Republican National Convention to disrupt it and uh, make an effort to prevent Richard Nixon from becoming president. And that's been well documented in other sources. Yeah. So well, he was going to protest. He wasn't, he's, you know, John, the interesting thing about him is, is that he was not Jerry Rubin was not part of that new left. He was, for all of his activity, a fairly moderate guy. You know, he was not someone who was going to storm the Bastille and chop your head off. I mean, he had a lot of bravado and there's a lot of anger that people talk about, but he was, if you're talking about revolution, you know you can count me out. Uh, this is where J. Edgar Hoover and uh, Haldeman and Ehrlichman and the others got it wrong. They thought he was Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Bobby Seale, Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, a variety of people who for their own reasons had their own belief systems. It's fine. What they misread with John and Yoko is that they had a slightly different agenda. Their agenda was this, peace and love. But they're associating with those guys. They're hanging out with Seal. Yeah, well, you know. They're it, hanging out with Ruben. They're working with Ruben. Sounds like the RICO Act. That <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you were hanging out with people who appear to be left-wing radicals, you know, making pronouncements and utterances that are clearly inflammatory, therefore, Ipso facto, you have to be one of them. Um, John and Yoko's message was give peace a chance. And all of these songs had to do with a resolution 
of the issues that were facing America in her 60s, or in the 1960s, that never involved violence, revolution, an assault on government, or any, they just got it wrong. 